<laughs> Did I ignore that? <laughs> now, the hard part of this is, of course, that <clears throat> Mr. Clark hand carved these, and uh, first he hand carved it, then he turned the piece, he says. Uh, I, th I think that sometimes he stretches the truth a little bit, but you <clears throat> and uh, the other part is that this piece of, of rosewood here, he stole from my burn pile <laughs> without paying me. So, uh, but uh, here again, utilizing the, the sapwood, heartwood that's available in the rosewood makes it a very special piece. And I especially like the, the cross rings. <laughs> that's beautiful. Okay, I'll here. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. Um, Talking about uh, Frank's burn pile uh, reminded me, I wanted to mention uh, every Tuesday that we have uh, a, t a meeting at Frank's, which means three times a month, the only week that we don't do it is the week we have the meeting here. Um, I go over there and I help Frank cut up whatever is lying around for logs. Uh, there's a lot of it. He just he gets the whole log. We take what we can out of it for whatever purpose we need. And a lot of it goes in the burn pile. There really are some treasures in there that we're just not going to uh, bother to turn into uh, anything else. So come and um, give a hand for an hour or two, and you're entitled to take home whatever you want. You get paid in wood for your labors on, on Tuesday. So everybody's welcome. Several of you have already come over and helped out, and we appreciate it. Uh, as you know, we're doing the bowls for the food shelf and uh, every week we uh, do a bunch more blanks um, and uh, I hope you're all come turning those and bringing them along we'll be delivering more uh, in a month or so to them and then again in the fall so um, I guess that's it uh, any, unless anybody has any other announcements uh, once again a, a huge thanks to our friends here at Advantage Lumber Christian up in the booth helping us with our technical uh, presentation. Uh, and I really, if, if you're new to Advantage Lumber, I really encourage you to walk around and look at the spectacular offerings. You may not be in the market for a $2,000 slab, but go in that room and you, you're not going to walk out empty handed, I can assure you. Some, some beautiful pieces of turning stock in there. So have a look. Um, our demonstrator tonight, um, Frank DiDomizio, hails from Canada. I promised him I wouldn't give him a long introduction. He can tell us as much as he wants about himself. Uh, he's very involved with the Peace River Turning Club down here when, he, when he's down here for the winter. He's also very active uh, with his club back in Canada. And as you can see from the pieces that he set up on the table, he, he's, uh, his specialty is embellishing um, uh, pieces, and he's going to show us how he does that. So uh, w without any more words from me, I'm going to turn it over to Frank and uh, let him start the program. Is this working okay? Yep, sounds like it is. Perfect. <clears throat> uh, what I'm going to take you through tonight is... Uh, I'm going to start with a bit of a slideshow. Well, first of all, I guess thanks to Russ and Advantage Lumber for having me here. Just fabulous. This is a, like a, a very fabulous uh, guild here or club. A lot of members. And it's really nice to see you support people who provide wood. So what I'm going to do tonight is just take you through a whole bunch of ways to embellish your platters. And not all of those are just used for platters. A lot of those techniques you can use on hollow forms, just regular bowls, just whatever you produce. So I'm just going to give you a whole smattering of different ways to embellish. And they're by no means ex uh, like a total list. There's a lot more, like I keep trying new things and discover new things. So I'm just showing you a smattering of the things that I can show you in this sort of time period. So I'll start off by first going through some slides. And uh, then what I'll do is I'll turn the back of a platter turn it around and turn the front of the platter and show you some embellishing techniques that you can do on the lathe. And then once I'm done that, I have some sample pieces here and I'll show you some embellishing techniques you can do off the lathe. 
So more and more now, I'm starting to do quite a bit of off the lathe work. So I'll produce the piece and then I'll spend a bunch of time decorating it, coloring it, putting dyes in it, texturing it, that sort of thing. So if we can have the slides. So my background, I've been turning for about 20 years. I belong to, I was president of the guild that I'm uh, a member of back in, uh, in Canada. I'm a member of three clubs back there. I've done quite a number of demonstrations. I've, I've demonstrated at a regional symposium. I have my work in sort of five galleries back all in Ontario. And, I've, and I teach out of my home, one-on-one uh, -on -one out of my studio. And I get quite a few students and I also do like all day seminars as well. Okay, so uh, let's, let's go on to the next slide. So what do I call a platter? So if you look at the images there, the only one that I kind of consider a platter in terms of what we're talking about today is the one in the center. The other ones are some kind of a bowl and they're much more functional. So when I talk about a platter, I kind of am leaning towards a non-functional decorative platter that somebody would put and look at rather than use. And I've kind of gravitated to that over the years. Uh, I only spent, probably spend a quarter of my time doing platters. I also do natural edge burls, I do some regular bowls, I do some artistic sculptural pieces and I do hollow forms. So about a quarter of my time on this sort of stuff. If you can't hear me, let me know and I'll speak up a bit or change this. Next slide. So some of the influences, a uh, long, long time ago, Al Sturt came by to our club and you can see the kind of work he does. And you can see that some of it is reflected in the work I am doing as well. And I've been really careful trying not to copy his work because once you get a platter and you get a rim on it, there's only so many things you can do on the outside of it. And you know, sometimes they start looking a little bit close to what he used to do. And I just, because I sell my work, I really don't want to copy other people's work. But if you're doing it for yourself, copying somebody's work is actually like, it's really nice to do. That's, that's a kind of compliment to them. If you're giving it to family, you're doing it for yourself. Next slide. Uh, a couple of other influences. Mark Salisbury, uh, about 20 years ago, he started all of the Canadian wood turning clubs. There weren't any at that time. And now just in Ontario, there's probably over 20 of them. And he did a lot of decorative platters. So that, that was another influence. And then when I go to conferences, I just look at everything that's there. I go to a lot of the AEW symposiums and I just look at what people are doing, again, just to get ideas, but not to copy. Next slide. So back before 2004, the only thing I was doing was platters like you see in the bottom left. And then that's when I sort of took the leap. I saw what Al Sturt was doing and I thought, okay, you know, putting color and ink and texturing on wood, oh, it just seemed like I didn't really want to do that. But I took, I took the leap and I've kind of never looked back. So those are my very first two pieces that I started doing something other than just a plain piece of wood. And you can start to see that the rims get a bit wider and the inner, inner part gets a little bit smaller. So more decorative, less functional. So move on to the next slide. So this is more the kind of stuff I'm doing now. Um, that's, that's a large 18 inch platter. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a little small one here. Uh, that was the first one I ever did. So it was probably five or six, eight years ago. A lot of times when I do a project or try something new, I'll make a small little platter like this just to see if it looks any good. And if it does, then I'll move on to something a little bit bigger. And if I like it, I'll offer it to some of the galleries. Next slide. Uh, this is another little piece that's here. Next slide. Uh, this one here, very similar. Um, I got the idea here, those three little lines and the balls at the end. My wife has a piece of jewelry that looks exactly like that. It has three little lines and a ball at the end. And I thought, there, that's where my inspiration come from. So you, you can look anywhere to get inspired. Next slide. So this was a piece that I don't think was very successful. I turned it and it had a piece of bark inclusion on the outer edge. So I did a bit of burning, I put some, some black around it, and that didn't look good. And I tried a little bit of burning in the middle, 
And I don't think that looked good. So to me, this was not a successful piece, but the idea here is just keep trying things until you see something that you like. Next slide. Uh, and this is another one that I think, although a lot of people look at it and say, oh, that's really nice, but you know what? I haven't sold that piece and it's been in the gallery a few times. And to me, it's too busy. There's just too much going on. There's some iridescent gold paint in the middle. There's, there's two rings of, of maple. There's a burnt ring that kind of stands out in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, it just, it's almost too much. So you have to think about that as well when you start embellishing. Sometimes less is better than too much. Next slide. Uh, this was a totally different kind of platter that I tried. Square platters, very, very thin, with piercing and a loon image. Uh, you know, it was one I tried, but I don't think I'm going to do it again. It just didn't turn my crank after I did it. <laughs> Next one. Uh, so, yeah, this is a large platter, curly birch. And so when I get a piece of wood that has a lot of figure in it, I don't want to do an awful lot to it because it already looks really, really nice. So all I did with this one is just put a little bit of dye on the outer surface and on the back to just enhance and pop out the grain and I left the, the center just the way it was. Next slide. Uh, this is sort of a signature piece and you can see it here in the middle, right up here. It's a kind of a signature piece that I have came up with maybe three or four years ago and I've kind of evolved it a little bit over those years. I th and, and it's funny, I thought I was the only one who did something like this. And about a year or two ago, I was flipping through either Pinterest or something on the AEW. And sure enough, there was somebody who did something very similar to this. And I thought, I didn't copy that person's. Did he copy mine? Like, I think two people in two different places can come up with the same thing, really. Next slide. And this is another one that I often do, where I kind of do some carving around the outside, some kind of ring in the middle. This particular one is, is uh, I just took a rotary tool and it's all, all kind of uh, carved out spots with uh, wood bleach to enhance the color there. And this is just a piece of uh, red oak, but it's a large piece. This is probably a 22 inch piece. Okay, next slide. And again, a piece of spalted maple, just beautiful figure. So I didn't want to fight with the figure and I just textured and uh, made the inside black. Okay, next slide. And just a few others where sometimes I do a bit of burning around the grain. Uh, there's one that has a bit of a tree carved into it and I did a bit of dye. So as you can see, I just kind of play around with different things and see what I like. Next slide. So now more than nuts and bolts. So in terms of preparing the blank, I usually, when I can, well, my platters are always turned out of dry wood. Sometimes I start with wet wood and rough turn it, but normally dry wood, and I buy it at places like this if I can, if it's, if it's not too pricey. And sometimes I harvest my own, just cut it up on the bandsaw or a big chop saw. And you can see me drilling the hole in the bottom. I do all of my platters on a screw chuck, which is what I'm going to use tonight. And that's just a heavy screw that goes in most of the chucks and it's used to secure it. You can use a face plate and other means, but the screw chuck is fast. Next slide. Um, for large pieces, I'll take it and, and just bring it in and chainsaw the corners off and then rough turn them, as you can see down below there. What, what I find is if you get a large piece it will actually, even if it's dry, it'll actually move because you're releasing the stresses in the wood. So I will try to rough turn it, leave it a bit thick, but rough turn it and then either if it's wet, I'll let it dry completely. If it's dry, I'll still rough turn it if it's a big piece and then just let it sit for maybe a week. All the stresses kind of come out of it and then I'll finish the piece. But when, and when I finish the piece, I do the whole piece in one sitting because if you've done the back, and then you're starting to do the front and you leave it, you know, a quarter inch or three eighths of an inch thick. That thing can warp on you quite easily, especially as you get larger in size. Next slide. For some of my thin pieces, I will use a glue blo block. So, so sometimes if you have a beautiful piece of wood, it's only an inch thick or an inch and a quarter thick. Just put a glue blo block on it, 
put a tenon on the glue block and just continue on. And most of the time I use hot melt glue, but I use a high strength hot melt glue, not the, not the white stuff that craft people use and use a really high strength gun or just use five minute epoxy. And uh, yeah, I use that quite often. In fact, one of these, yeah, this one right here was a thin piece of maple and you can see I've used a glue block on there. So I use, it, I use them quite, quite often. Next piece. Uh, in terms of the gouges I use, I've kind of gravitated to basically what Glenn Lucas and Mike Mahoney use. This is pretty close to what they use. 50 to 55 degree bevel with a swept back, which I do most of my turning with. And then in, in larger bowls that are deeper and I have a, a big flat area in the bottom, I'll use a blunter, uh, a blunter bevel, 60 to 65 degrees, with the wings not swept back so much. And then uh, for uh, scraping, when I do scraping, I always use a negative rake scraper that has, that has a double bevel. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I'm doing my turning with the burr on top. I just find that's a lot more forgiving. Uh, when I'm teaching, I, I always start students off with uh, a negative rake scraper. I never ever introduce them to a regular traditional scraper. I, have, I use the negative rake and I have them doing shear scraping right from the get-go and they go, oh, well, this is easy. So they've never been introduced to like sticking a scraper in and getting all these tear out and all the rest of it. Um, I'm gonna pass this around. These, these are the bevels that I use, that I showed up there. Okay, um, and I guess, I guess I can pass around my negative rake scraper that I use quite a bit as well. I'll need this guy back. Well, actually I need them all back. Uh, and there's nothing fancy about the negative rake scraper. It's just a skew. I mean, before that, I used to use skews to uh, dig up flowers because I do not like using a skew. But now I use them as negative rake scrapers and they do a great job. Next slide. Uh, the, uh, the grain orientation for a platter is side grain. So the grain is, is going across the piece of wood this direction and we're cutting it just like a regular bowl. So the, the grains are sticking out here, just like as if they were pieces of straw, and you cut, you cut this way kind of thing. And, and I'll demonstrate that when I'm actually doing my turning. Next slide. I do use the golden ratio a little bit to give me proportions for how I size my platter. And I'll show you how I do that in the demonstration itself. And then uh, texturing tools, I, I'll go through a whole bunch of them, but I use a variety of texturing tools that can do some kind of embellishment, and I don't care how it does it. Sometimes I do it really quick. I don't like to take a long, long, long time to spend doing texturing. I like to hopefully try to do them relatively quickly, but some of them do take a little bit longer. Okay, oh, jumbo jaws. It, uh, sometimes my platters are quite large and the normal jumbo jaws aren't big enough to accommodate turning the backs of them off. So I've just made some uh, plywood extensions, that nice hard Baltic birch or whatever they call it now, multi-layered plywood that's really strong and just extended the jaws so I can get larger platters on. Next slide. Here you can see that I've got uh, the platter mounted with the jumbo jaws and I've, t I've taken the original uh, little nubs that come with them and I use these soft inch high wine corks that you can buy from some, from some of the stores that have a hole pre-drilled in them. And then what I'm doing there in the top left, that's how I remove the, remove the glue block. So that particular piece had a glue block on it and I just put it between centers, put something soft up between it and then take a thin parting tool and just keep going in until it just starts to wobble. And the glue actually melts as you're, as you, you're doing that because you're introducing heat. And then I just pull it off, There's nothing elaborate. And then I save the glue block and use it again. Next slide. So the, uh, primarily I use black as my decoration piece for a lot of my platters. And I played around with different finishes. 
The, uh, this particular thing is the same that's shown there. And what I played around with was black gesso, India ink, things like leather dyes, and then just an NGR black stain. And where I've gravitated to now is the only thing I use now is the black gesso. And gesso is the stuff that artists use. Mostly it's white, but you can buy black gesso and you can buy it at Michael's or any art supply place. And the same as India ink. And the reason I like using India ink, it's a little bit thicker than stuff like leather dye and NGR stain. So it doesn't run and seep into edges nearly as much. And secondly, India ink is archival. So it doesn't fade over time. So those are the two I've gra gravitated to. And the way I use them is if I'm doing a surface like this, where I want to carve through it, and I want to be able to see the wood quite easily through it, I'll use the gesso because it's, it's very thick and it sits right on the surface. When I'm doing a, car uh, a piece like this one here or this one here that has texture and I don't want to hide that texture, then I use the India ink. So that's kind of my rule of thumb. I'm going to pass this guy around as well. Next slide. <clears throat> oh, and here I am. There's my lathe. I turn on a, a, a robust lathe. It's American Beauty, 25 inch. It's got a three horsepower motor. And uh, next slide. And someday I might turn a really big platter. <laughs> but that's not me. OK, that's it for the slideshow. And now we can get down and make some chips. <clears throat> so I'll just start off with a little note about safety. Just uh, for anybody who's a new turner and even an experienced turner, just be really safe with what you're doing. Make sure you wear a face shield when there's loud stuff. Put earplugs on. When you can, work between centers so the piece doesn't flip off. Um, and just, you know, just use common sense in terms of the way you approach the tool and your turning speed. The faster you turn, you typically will get a better cut. If you think of wheat standing up and you come by with a sigh and slice it off, well, if you go slow, it all goes like this. If you go fast, it just cuts it off really fast. So the faster the speed, typically you'll get a cleaner cut. However, when you're starting off, if you get a catch, you get a bigger catch if it's going fast. So it's a sort of a, it's a bit of a trade-off. Okay, we'll uh, let's see, we'll move this out of the way. Now, if that light interferes with the image, just let me know. So I've got a screw chuck in here, and most of the times, and, and that just comes with, with, the, uh, with the chuck, most of the times the screw is, is a way larger than really what you need. And even a piece like this, you know, I don't need a lot of thread engagement. So I typically put, put one of these on, and this is especially important when you only have, when you're only working with a piece of wood that's an inch thick, I have a thicker, a thicker one that I put on. So we'll just thread this on. This particular piece, I've just rough turned it a little bit before I got here. And the outside edge is actually coated. So I'm not gonna turn the outside edge, it's actually coated with that shellac base sealer, the, I just use the Zinzer stuff, I think you can get at Home Depot. And the reason I do that is whether I'm using gesso or India ink, if I'm putting that on the surface of here, I don't want it seeping into the edge. So this helps it from seeping in. Typically when I put the India ink or the gesso on, I still do a final cut later, but I don't want any of that to have seeped in there. So I'm just going to turn the back of the platter here and just get my stuff ready here. Somebody said I should wear this really beautiful Advantage Lumber 
jacket, so I'm going to do that as long as it's not too hot because it is a really hot day today. Still hear me okay? Oh, maybe not quite as well. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds better. <clears throat> so just a little tip in terms of when you start up, start up the lathe. I see I'll have to turn this way to keep, keep it going. So when I start up the lathe, I never put my live center in and then start it up. It always tends to shake. So I generally start it up really slow, then put the live center in, it just seems to center itself, doesn't shake. I just do that all the time. Just a small little tip. Okay. I'm just going to mark where the, uh, where the base of this is going to be. So this is going to be a tenon just for my uh, a tenon for my chuck, and I just want to see that it's okay here. Yeah, looks good. Can you see everything? Good. So when I the majority of my cuts for platters are are using a pull cut. So the traditional way to get a really good finish is normally with a push cut. A pull cut, you can still rub the bevel. So the bevel's rubbing there and as soon as I get a little bit of of that surface catching, so it's still a bevel rubbing cut. It doesn't rub nearly as well as a push cut. You don't, typically you won't get quite as nice of a finish, but if you've got a tight grained wood and your speed is up and all the rest of it, you'll get a, a pretty decent finish. So sometimes, depending on the wood, I, I will finish off with a push cut, but I do the majority of it with a pull cut. And, there, and I can also see the shape of the platter developing a little better. Now, with the, the grain of the wood is running this way, so the little, the little strands of the little strands of wheat or straws are running like this. So cutting across the grain is totally fine, and cutting this way is totally fine. Cutting this way in into the grain is not fine. You'll get a lot of tear out and catches and all the rest of it. It's a bit of vibration, so just turn it down a little bit until the vibration goes down. And I'm just going to start to shape the back of it then using this pull cut that I talked about. And typically I'm using this to hog wood out. I'm not trying to do anything fancy. I'm just trying to get the basic shape. Once it gets closer to the shape I'm looking for, then I slow down and I do a nicer pull cut. If I don't get a good finish, then I'll do a push cut. In a 15 inch platter, when you're doing one of these pulls, like just one pull that I did, in a 15 inch platter, you're cutting about 220 feet of wood. So once I've done the back of this, I have to change tools. It's going to be dull. So when you're turning, just make sure you're aware of whether your tool is sharp or not. So 
So another efficient way to cut, hmm, just not used to this, this one way, it, uh, there we go. You don't have to put it down very far for it to, to lock in. Another efficient way is to just to cut in directly this way. As I was saying before, the fibers are this way, so cutting across the grain is totally fine. So that's a nice, fast way of removing wood. And if you're rubbing the bevel, which I am doing right now, if you're rubbing the bevel, you don't need a lot of pressure. You can put one finger on there. So that's, that's the thing you want to sort of strive for, is to guard that bevel when you're doing final push cuts. I'm not after a final shape or anything here. I'm just showing you technique more than anything else. Typically the bottom of my platters are either convex, concave, or an OG. Those are the three, the only three I, I basically use on the bottom of my bowls. And because this is a thick one, I would probably do a convex. Convex? Yeah. Concave, I think, actually. Concave. I'm getting a bit of a vibration there because this one, actually, this piece has a bit of a knot. Yeah. has a bit of a knot in it. So there's just a little bit of vibration there. Well, and you can see sometimes I'm using a push cut, like this is a push cut, like that. That's a push cut. And if you're riding the bevel, it just follows, just follows it right down nicely. And then sometimes I'm using a pull cut. Tool is actually hot. That's what's the that's what the trouble is. I'm trying to hold it and it's it's hot. I've been doing so much cutting. So I'm having trouble actually getting it close to where I want it to be here. There we go. And as you can see I just changed hands. So be comfortable with I can turn from with, with either hand. So be find if you can turn with either hand, it's a lot more flexible in terms of the work you're doing. So I'm just going to square, square this up to get my, uh, my tenon here. From a safety perspective, I really should have turned that off. And then move the tool rest. Okay, so that looks okay. So this tool is black already, just because it's it's been turning so much wood, it's starting to dull there. I can actually see the black on the wood. And these are Thompson tools, so I mean they're they hold up quite well, but uh, even these tools can only do so much cutting. Remember, one stroke, 220 feet of cutting, and I've done a lot more, you know, probably more than 10 strokes here.
This is maple, by the way, just... A tight grain wood. I like using tight grain woods for the platters. Ash is okay, depending on what you're doing with it. So when you're doing your last cut, I would probably use a sharper tool, but I'm, what I'm gonna do is just try to raise it up a little bit more and just do a really slow, slow, slow fine cut at more of a shear angle. And let's see the surface on that. So in this case, the surface actually is not that bad. If the surface was, if it had a lot of tear out in it, what I would do is remove this and do a, a nice push cut all the way through it. And then the other reason I like to use this pull cut is I typically will stand right here, which is in the line of fire. However, it's totally held here and it's totally held there. So very unusual for this, a piece like this between centers to ever come off. Okay, so I've left it kind of thick because I'm gonna do a few things on the surface I may need on the front where I may need to take some more material off. So this has a, quite a few little ridges on it. There's no tear out, but there's a few little ridges just because the environment I'm in here, it's not like I'm not at home doing a nice steady cut with music going and all the rest of it. <laughs> so what I do to f finish up that surface, the objective you have as turners is to get that surface as good as you can before you start sanding. So get all the tear out out of it, get all the little lines out of it, and then, then you can start with 120, 180, you know, rather than starting with 60 or 80 and then sanding till the cows come home. You don't wanna do that. So what a lot of people would start to do now, oh, I see my tool hasn't come back. I think I have a second one. So what a lot of people do now is, uh, oh, I've got all these bumps, what am I gonna do? They go in and scrape it. They just go in like this and just go in with a traditional scraper and just create all kinds of tear out. They'll get all the little lines out, but there's tear out there that just takes a lot of time to sand out. So I would just recommend take your scraper and just put another, a second bevel on it so it looks more like a skew. It just has a bevel this way and a bevel this way. And then that, that's the first step in getting a little bit better scraper. It's less grabby, gives you a little bit better finish. But then the next step is to take that and put it up on its angle and use it as a shear scraper. So that you're, you're just taking really fine, fine, fine little wisps off that look like this. If you're getting dust, you're not doing it right. So use the bottom quarter of that tool in a nice controlled pull cut and uh, and you just get a beautiful surface that you can now start to sand. There's a bit of a hump here so if you feel a hump what I do typically if I feel a hump I can feel I can actually see the hump but I'll if I feel the hump I put a line there and then I just go back and forth until that little hump's gone. But in actual fact, if you close your eyes and go like this, you can feel it way better than just your eyes will tell you. you... So that's one method of shear scraping. 
And that's typically the method I teach because it's dead simple. You saw what I did there. It's hard to get a catch. It does it leaves a nice surface. What you see a lot of guys doing is using so this this tool here has a bevel here and a bevel there. It's been sharpened so there's a burr on the top. Well, if you look at the bottom of a bowl gouge, it has a bevel there, another bevel on this side, and it's been sharpened so that the burr is on the top. So you see a lot of people will use this to do their shear scraping. And you can, and you can use this. It's a little harder and a little trickier. It's so much easier using that skew. So, so I, can use, I can use either one, but I'm so used to teaching the other one because it's, it's just simple. There's just nothing to it. You see, I'm still getting, still getting those fine little angel hair shavings there on a really nice surface. Okay, I think that's it for the back. Uh, I forgot to mention that I think Russ was kind enough to... I have, I have a four-page handout, which I think was emailed to everybody. I see some heads shaking. Everybody seen that? Okay. If you, ha if you hadn't, I was going to pass it around and say that it, it can be emailed. So if you don't have it, the club's got them. Um, you know, feel free to use it. it. It's just a summary of everything I've done tonight. So I think that's it for the back. Uh, where's my notes? Yeah, that's it. We're gonna do the, we're gonna do the front now and get on to some of the texturing techniques. I just happened in the wood turning by accident. You know, about 20 years ago, I was doing a project and I was doing a bit of carpentry, furniture type stuff back then. And I had a, a curly maple wash stand and I had to turn these legs. And I had done all kinds of woodworking, taught myself woodworking, and was fairly accomplished in it. I was making some really nice stuff. But these were the first legs I ever had to turn. And I didn't have a lathe and I didn't have a clue how to use a lathe. So there was a school close to us and they, uh, they had a kind of a program where you could go in and use their tools. And I went in and I used their, their big sander and they had a great big planer and I, I was able to use all that myself. The shop teacher could figure that out, I, that I knew my way around the tools. And I said, well, how do you, I got these legs to turn now. What do I do? He, he looks at me and he goes, Oh, well, shop teachers usually aren't very good turners. <laughs> he says, well, this tool is this, this tool does that, and just go to it. Wow, I mean, it was the hardest freaking thing I've ever done. I couldn't believe it. I, it took me all one night to do one leg, and it was terrible. It, like it was, the, I did the bumps weren't, or the beads and coves weren't where I wanted. And, and he said, you know, I can't really teach you too much, but we have a wood turning club that meets here first Tuesday of the month. I go, well, I've only got three of my legs done. I've got to get a fourth done. So I went there, and they had the show and tell table. And it's like, holy smokes, look at all the stuff. This, these, look at all the artsy fartsy stuff these guys are doing. I said, I just want to turn legs. So I got talking to a few people, and the president was really nice enough to bring me to his house, and he showed me how to turn properly. And, you know, I kept going, and the guys were all really friendly and shared their information, not like woodworkers. A lot of woodworkers don't share as much as wood turners, I found. Anyway, he, uh, well, it's true. Now, well, especially professional woodworkers, because they don't want people copying their stuff. Wood turners don't seem to be like that. Anyway, six months later, you know, I go, I'm still in the club, and it's like, well, who wants to turn these silly legs? I want to do that artsy stuff. Yeah, and then I was hooked. So the same thing, 
I spin it first. I'm going to do it between centers again just to be safe. Okay. Didn't quite sit in there perfectly, but it's not too bad. Let me just make sure that's good and tight. Now, where I use the golden ratio or golden rule kind of thing is I have one of these one of these uh, measuring things that I got from Lee Valley, and it has the golden ratio right on it. So there's none of this, uh, okay, there's one, and then there's 1.618 measurement type of thing. It's just if I measure, you know, that's six inches, the other one shows you where the six inch is for the smaller ratio. And I'll show you how I use that. So what do we got here? Yeah, so that's six and a half. Sorry, four and a half. Four and a half. Okay, so if I was to do a more functional bowl, I would uh, four and a half. Four and a half, four and a half. So the, if I use the golden ratio. That's where the golden ratio would tell me that I would do a more functional bowl. So this would be the rim out here, and this would be the center. But I tend to like to do non-functional bowls, so I kind of use the other, the other way. Instead of this being small and this being big, I have the outside being big and the inside being small. Four and a half. I'll go the other way. So it's more like that. And, it, and as you can see, most of my platters are that way. They have a small center and a larger canvas because I'm using this for decoration and embellishment. So it gives me more canvas to work with. And I just use this as a guide. I mean, I don't, it's not like really exact and sometimes I move it a bit. I'm just using it as, a, as an approximate guide to get me where I want to be. Uh, do we take a break or do I go right to the end? I, I go right to the end, you don't, there's no break in between? So I'm, I'm using that same pull cut. Now, a lot of times you'll see on YouTube and all kinds of things, guys come in here like this. You'll see guys coming across there like that. When that's pointed at the nine o'clock position, it's no different than sticking a scraper in and doing that. It's, you're just scraping the wood. So that's why I like to do this pull cut where I have the handle down quite a bit I'm rubbing the bevel and then riding or gliding on that bevel and I'm getting curls, not dust. So it's, it's actually cutting. This tool is not cutting as well. I didn't change tools. But for what we're doing, it's probably fine. It's just, this isn't really a session to teach you how to turn. It's more, I'm just showing you the, the way I use the tool, the way I make my cuts, and to basically give you some ideas that you can kind of go home and experiment with. And again, it's not just for platters. You can use this on some of the techniques for embellishing, you can use them anywhere, really, on 
any kind of turning or even non-turning things. I'm not even going to scoop out the whole bowl. I'm just doing a little bit of it. Just I'm not sure how well you can see that, but so a lot of times when you start like this, often you'll get a catch and it'll run this way on you. So the way to prevent that is come in at the three o'clock position, and as soon as you're in cutting, turn it, open it up to 45 degrees and then glide that bevel all the way down. And just like before, if you're doing it right, you're gliding the bevel down, you don't need a lot of pressure on that piece to get a nice smooth cut all the way down. I'm getting a little bit of bouncing there, so I, I tend to push a little bit harder down or go back behind it and get, and, uh, and get the bounce out. If Sometimes if it's bouncing, there's either a knot there or you're actually pushing the bevel too hard against the wood. You just want to glide it over the wood. So speed up the lathe, take a, take a slower cut, just a whole bunch of different ways. But if you're rubbing the bevel or gliding the bevel nicely here, you won't get tear out. So I am going to change tools now because this is getting a bit dull and I just want to finish off that surface a little better. These Thompson tools are really nice where you can just interchange the handle. So at home what I have, I just have a whole bunch, this is an old Thompson handle. They don't make them anymore. They're now all aluminum, but even the aluminum ones, I. I coat them with uh, like a, a tennis wrap and then you can put a ho soft hockey tape over it because I just don't like the hard feel of aluminum on my hands. These feel so much nicer. And then you can just interchange these. I take, you know, I probably have six, five or six of the half inch, five or six of the five eighths. When they're all dull, I just take them to the grinder, like a CBN wheel and just grind them all up. Yeah, it cuts much, much nicer now with that sharp tool. You can eat, I, well, I don't know if you can see, I can see the difference. So again, I'll take, I'll take the shear scraper and just flatten off the surface for us to do our embellishments on. Okay, so let's start with some simple things. The, uh, a lot of people use beads on their platters in some form or fashion, and you can, uh, you can get these fancy D-Way tools, which are really nice if you're doing a whole bunch of beads that look the same, but if you don't want to pay for one of those and you just want something simple, you can just uh, very easily make beads with, with a skew. So this is just a, a point tool. It's just, it's just a place for, for where the outside edge of the bead will be. So 
So I just, I just now take a, a small skew. I have them, it's, it's basically exactly the same as that little shear scraper that was passed around. Uh, one side has a burr on it and the other side doesn't. So I take the side that has the burr on it and this, this, this one has the burr on the top side. And if you only have one skew, you can just go resharpen it the other way to get the burr on the other side. But basically you just come around like that. Like that. And you can make small beads, big beads. And then this one has the burr on the top and it goes the other way. I'm just going to have to pull this back a little bit because it's in the way. And you just make the other side of the bead. There we go. So the, uh, I'll pass this around in a minute because it'll show you the beads and the texturing technique that I'm doing. So what I want to do now is I have an area in between the beads or I could leave it the same height. I could texture it. I could do whatever with it. I could just leave it. But what, what I, one of the things I typically do is take that area down a little bit further. There we go. And if it's not quite flat, you can go in there with your skew and flatten it a little bit. But I'm, it's going to be textured anyway, so you don't have to do too much. And then my little V scraper, I'll just put a little mark in, in here. I'll mark in here. Okay, so now what do you so now that all of a sudden has created a bit of difference in height and it just looks a little more interesting. So you could just leave it at that, or you could start to texture the inside of that, or you could paint the inside of that. Now I'm just going to show you a quick on lathe technique to texture it. So I just take, take a wire brush and I've taken this to a grinder and sort of taken the rough sides out of it. And it's a coarse one because I find the coarse one does a little bit better finish. And I just go in the opposite direction that the wood is going. And it just creates an interesting looking texture on this that's done very very quickly and sometimes this hits the bead and you just go back and repair the bead or what I've been doing now actually is I I just make a little bit of the bead I do this and then I finish the bead later So you can use this technique, yeah, there's a little bit of it, that's good enough. You can use this technique, again, you put a band on your hollow form, you put a, I, I actually put a band like this around my salad bowl to make it my own distinctive thing. So if the salad bowl is like this about a third of the way down, I put a, uh, maybe a one inch, two inch band and I just texture it like this, just sets it off. It's not just your ordinary bowl all of a sudden. Uh, now sometimes I leave that just the way it is. Sometimes I'll put some uh, two-part wood bleach on it 
Uh, sometimes I dye that black. So it's just a variety of different things. If you are going to uh, color that or dye it or put, put some kind of coloring on it, what you want is that it, it, uh, the dye doesn't bleed into, this, into the parts beside it. And the way to prevent that is to have a burn line there. So if you had a wood burner, you could make a, wood, a nice line there and then you could put your India ink right up to the edge of that line and it usually doesn't cross that line, it stops there. But it's pretty hard to do this with a wood burner. So I just use these pieces of Arborite, which you can get from uh, Home Depot or Lowe's. It's kitchen counter stuff. And when you, and the, these are the little samples, they're free. And you just, free is good. Yeah. You want it spinning pretty quickly. Sometimes I put it just on the outside ring because if I'm painting the outside black, then it doesn't bleed in. But sometimes I put it on the inside ones just for decoration as well. So let's do the inside ones. And all of a sudden you can see that it, it looks a little bit different, just sets it off a bit. Nice simple technique. So that'll stop you, stop the, uh, the stuff from bleeding through, particularly the India ink. Okay. So now we look at this and say, well, okay, we've done that so far, but maybe we want to do a little bit more to the outside platter. So what could we do to the outside to create a nice, simple texture that's easy to do and fast? So let me just shear scrape this outer edge. Make sure I'm starting off with a, a relatively good surface. That looks pretty good. And if I was at home, I would probably sand that down to 220 because the techniques I do now, I use India ink. And with India ink, you can kind of see the grain a bit. You can kind of see flaws. It covers up a little bit, but it doesn't cover up a lot. So I would sand it to maybe 220. But the shear scraping gets you pretty, pretty darn close. You can probably start with 180 and then 220 and then go on to do these things that I'm going to show you how to do. So a lot of people have one of these things. It's one of these sorb sorby texturing tools. And this is a quick, easy way to get a kind of an interesting, interesting surface on the outside of your platter. You get one shot at it though. But if you, and if you don't like it, just take, take it off and do it, like, do it again. I mean, so let's see what we're, what we're gonna do here. Get it going fairly quickly. You don't. You want it relatively vertical. If if it's too much like this, I find it doesn't spin enough. Okay, that's the one shot. Yeah, yeah, it's a really interesting look. You probably can't see it in a lot of detail. So what I have here is I have a piece that basically has the things that I've just done on the front of that platter. It has the sorbet texturing tool, it has the two beads, and it has that wire, that wire texture, and it has the, the one burn line. This one only has the one burn line. So just pass that around. So that's what I've done so far. So again, if you don't like the look of that, let's just take it off and do something different. Just using that pull cut again to flatten off the surface and take off 
all those little marks we just put on. So you can see in the piece that's passed around, those marks aren't very deep. And if you were to put gesso on that, it would almost hide them. So on that type of piece, I would use the India ink because you can then still see all those little marks you just made, which is what I'm after. And you know, somebody looks at that and go, look at all the time they spent making all those little marks. Well, you saw how long it took me. It's all about the speed on that kind of thing. I'll just do a quick shear scrape again just to uh, flatten off that surface for So there's a, all kinds of other things you can do to the surface of this. And I'm going to show you one now that's, well, let's just say it's not for the faint of heart. So this is an Arbor Tech. I don't know if people are familiar with it. They uh, use it for carving, carbide blades. And, you know, they use it for carving all kinds of shapes. But it's a great tool for putting a really quick carved surface on the out of, outside of your platter. And again, you get one shot at this. It's freehand. So you got to be, you know, hold a tool like this. And uh, pray, pray for the best. So here we go. too bad I held it a little bit too long in the center so if I were to do this again I would probably I would probably redo this because I held it a little bit too long in the center and there's a bit of a line there but it's very close looking to this platter here so I'll send this around this this pattern is exactly from that technique in fact this whole platter is what we did tonight it's got the two burn lines it's got the it's got the, uh, the wire brushing, and I have dyed this one because it's a different color. And I've got the black lines, and this has the Indian ink on it. So the pattern I've created is very similar to that, except for the inner ring looks a little bit too... Well, I'm not that happy with it. I would redo that because it doesn't quite look like the outer part of it. But it gives you the idea. Absolutely. You don't want it going too fast. If it's going too fast, you'll just get a very few of these little lines. And if it's going too slow, which I probably had it too slow, you'll have too many, too many of the little gouges in one spot, and they're not distributed enough. What speed are you running the at? Ooh, I can't tell you that. It's sort of a gut feel. For that texturing? For the texturing? I don't know. I don't look at speeds. I, it's just whatever kind of feels right. The same thing when, when I'm turning. If I'm not getting a good clean surface, turn it up. Well, I do, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that. So I'm going to show you some on, uh, off lathe texturing techniques now. That's all the stuff for on the lathe. So let's see if the camera can come over to this area here. Oh yeah, we're kind of far away, aren't we? Oh, you can do that? That's perfect. Okay, I'll try to hold it this way and see if we can zoom in a bit. So this, this, is partic this particular platter is the type that I was mentioning that I do with the black gesso. And here I create some kind of pattern. I put it on with a, a white, a white uh, pencil. Uh, 
sometimes I use that, sometimes I just do free form. So the first t technique I'll show you here is just, just take a carver and just carve through the black gesso. So you can follow a pattern. So in this one here, I've created a white uh, pattern and you just basically go through and follow it through. Uh, this is the other pattern that you saw on, on one of my other, other platters. Okay, and then I have uh, just a random pat pattern that I've created on this piece right here. And this one I just do it by eye, basically. So there's all, and then uh, the, this is just a little X pattern. The idea here is that you can just play around with this technique. Now the other thing you can do here is you can use a rotary carver, like a, like a fancy Dremel, and uh, create, it, it will also go through the, the gesso. So rather than carve through, you can uh, also follow these little lines with a rotary carver. I know it sounds like you're at the dentist. It doesn't give quite as clean of a finish, but it follows, uh, it follows curves a little better. Okay, and then uh, I'm just going to put it in a little bit larger bit and you'll see a lot of my platters have an inner area that's all stippled like this one here it's all stippled and then I've put black gesso on it and then I do a final cut afterwards so the way I make that inner stipple is is quite simple it's just it's just a ball just a bigger ball and it's no more complicated than that. I just make a whole bunch of little, these little indentations and then uh, put black gesso over it and then make a nice final cut. Just something to break, break it up a little bit because the early platters I did with this, I left them totally plain on the inside and black and I used gesso, but I found I could never get the gesso nice and flat. I always had these little lines in them. And I said, well, why don't I just put these, these little, little holes in there? It doesn't matter what the gesso looks like. But you know, it ends up, ended up looking way better. So again, just play around with things. So that's those tools. And so then we can move on to uh, burning tools. That was that one. That one. Burning tool. So this 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 one here is the inverse of what I was doing before. I just draw these on by by eye basically and balance them and I just burn these in rather than carve them out they're burned in so I'll just take a bit of a burner here and oh you're on top there we go Practice on a little scrap piece of wood until you get 
the flame the way you want it or the, the uh, incision the way you want it. And then uh, just follow the curve. Takes a little bit of getting used to it. But it's very effective. And then I do some freeform ones, just like I did with the freeform carving. I do some of these as freeform free form lines. And then in some cases I have, I haven't brought all of my, my uh, pyrography uh, pens here, but you, I don't know if you can see, there's a, some of these I make my own little designs. This one's very, very similar to what Molly Winton does. It's her design. She takes, she takes one of these coils and wraps it around a nail and then put, puts it in a, a gun and makes a really, really interesting pattern like this. That again, you don't, you don't have to use it on a platter. You can use it on hollow forms, bowls, where, wherever you want to put an interesting looking band. And then sometimes I just use a little ball and make a, a ball kind of texture. And then the other thing I want to show you here, it probably won't show up very well, but if you come and feel it later, I don't know if you've seen some pieces that seem to have a, a really nice orange peel effect all over them. I've always wondered how that was done. And uh, I took a class with uh, Paul Fennell, and he showed me this technique. And, it, and it's relatively simple. You just take a, a Dremel engraver, uh, that typically you can't get the speed down fast enough. So what he uses and then what I use is one of these, uh, it's a router speed control and you just have it going relatively slow. So a very simple technique. What's nice about it is you can, you can still totally see the wood underneath. I had a really nice burl piece where I wanted to do something with the rim, but I didn't want to turn it black or do anything with it because it looks so nice. And I just used this all the way around the rim and it was just subtle, but you could still see the burl under it. So it was really effective. I think that covers everything. Are there any questions? Uh, no, the way I do that, it's not offset. The way I do this is when it's in the chuck here, I mark three spots at 120 degrees. I loosen the chuck. I slant this at one of the marks. And then in my tailstock, I have a, a router mounted, one of these laminate routers with a V groove. And I just spin this by hand so the high side hits. Then once I have the groove, the depth that I like, I flatten it out, turn it to the next mark, turn it out, and then do an inner groove. And then uh, create the three grooves. Then I paint the grooves. And then I put the piece back and I resurface it. Because you can never get the grooves really, really crisp and you can never get the paint really, really crisp. So it's a bit of a process. So I paint the inside, paint the grooves, and then completely resurface it which you need a nice steady hand for. That's it, folks. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, I hope that motivates uh, all of us to go back to our shops and try some embellishing. Uh, there are so many different tools available uh, now. Sorby makes a lot of different ones. Wagner is another company that makes uh, texturing tools. Uh, we have a wonderful selection. Uh, before we adjourn, uh, we're going to have our raffle. We all set for that, Tom? Okay. <laughs>